going to talk to you guys about interventional oncology. This is our facility, Methodist Dallas Medical Center. While you guys were driving up, you could have seen the new tower. This hospital's been around since 1927, and it's a 555-bed hospital. It's actually growing since the new tower. It has greater than 250 physicians representing greater than 60 specialties. Um, it houses the Liver Institute, which is essentially dedicated to the treatment of liver disease, including liver tumors. I'm proud to be at a facility that's one of the oldest interventional uh, oncology programs, which is my specialty, and one of the first Y90 programs in the nation. We really have, this center has um, uh, more experience than the vast majority of centers in the United States as far as selective internal radiation therapy of the liver. What makes us different, I think, than a lot of other specialties is the fact that we are multidisciplinary which basically means we practice as a team. There's not really one doctor who does everything. It's like we're, it's teamwork. Um, every case, every patient that comes to us is seen by multiple different physicians. Um, and we decide, depending on the patient's condition, what the best uh, type of treatment and therapy this patient should get. Uh, we also have multiple different options, multimodality approach as far as a patient. Patients can have open surgery, they can have laparoscopic surgery, they can have an interventional procedure, they can have chemotherapy, um, external beam radiation. Everything is kind of tailored depending on how the patient presents. We mentioned some of the conferences and the reason that we're you're, it's going to keep coming back to these conferences is the fact that um, is the fact that the conferences are really what dictate what we do with the patient. We have a total of three conferences that are uh, dedicated to treatment of tumors. Um, we have one on Tuesdays, one on Wednesdays, and one on Thursdays. And in these three conferences, we'll, you'll, we'll have representation from the hepatologist like Dr. Mantry, a medical oncologist like Dr. Kanan, a surgical oncologist like Dr. Chang, radiation oncologist, pathologist, and interventional oncologist like myself. Um, what I'm going to focus on or tell you guys about today is interventional oncology. Many of you guys probably never heard of it. And what is interventional oncology? You guys have probably, many of you have probably never met an interventional radiologist or an oncologist. Essentially, it's a specialty that um, uh, arises from diagnostic radiology. We all know what a radiologist does. A radiologist looks at x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, and they kind of make diagnoses of different tumors. Um, in the past 15 uh, to 20 years, people have used the ability to be able to look inside of a patient um, and uh, uh, through very minimally invasive techniques, guide catheters, needles, wires inside of patients and be able to mechanically treat different types of tumors. So that developed the, the birth of interventional radiology. Now in the past, I would say five to 10 years, um, there's been a very, uh, with the advent of technology and newer techniques, uh, this has given birth to interventional oncology, which is basically a branch of interventional radiology that's dedicated to the treatment of liver tumors. Uh, in, in this uh, picture here, this is a catheter going in directly inside of a liver tumor and giving it high doses of, uh, of, of chemotherapy. There's many things that an interventional radiologist can do when it comes to a cancer patient. Um, uh, there's, we can treat liver diseases, renal, lung, bone, and other conditions. However, uh, for, we have, uh, as far as when it comes to this talk, my focus is going to be on looking at liver-directed uh, therapy. Um, now, why is it the liver? Why do we have a program today just about liver? Why is this not a program about metastatic colorectal cancer? Or why is this not a program about breast cancer or about hepatoma, hepatocellular carcinoma? Um, it's, and thanks to people like Suzanne Lindley and other survivors, there's a common um, ground when it comes to tumors that go to the liver or either grow in the liver primarily or they are tumors that spread to the liver. The common ground is that the liver is frequently um, the final battlefield in the fight against cancer. Now, this is really true for almost majority of cancers. The liver is probably one of the most likely places that cancers like to go to. And a lot of times people don't die from their colon cancer, they don't die from their breast cancer, but they will die from the tumor that ends up going to the liver. It's like fertile ground for a tumor to just thrive and grow. And a lot of times they end up dying from the liver tumor and not their breast cancer in the breast or their colon cancer in the colon. And this is really why the YES program uh, you know, strives to educate and support all supporters living with the diagnosis of liver tumors. Um, it's kind of awareness that there is an option for tumors that end up landing in the liver. 
Uh, as far as the different techniques we offer, one of the oldest ones is transarterial chemoembolization. And essentially what this is, um, uh, people who've discovered this type of therapy, so if this is the liver right here and these are tumors in the liver, um, uh, we have found through research that if we go into these arteries and block these blood vessels that are leading to these tu that are going to these tumors, we can essentially deprive the liver tumor of nutri nutrients, of blood. They want blood just as much as any other cell in our body. And if we're able to do that, um, they shrink. So if you block a blood vessel with uh, embolics, that's called an embolization. If there's no chemo, we call it bland embolization. You don't need to remember that. However, if we add chemo to it, we then call it chemoembolization or transarterial chemoembolization. Um, this is a schematic that basically shows how we do it. We go into a, a groin artery, Kalman femoral artery, which is a large vessel in the, in the hip area. We then take up a catheter all the way up to the liver, and these are the tumors, and we administer these little tiny particles um, that are actually made out of contact lens material, but, but they're very tiny particles that go in and they essentially block the blood flow to the liver. I showed you guys this picture, which is essentially what it looks like to us when we're doing the procedure. Our catheter is in the hepatic artery, treating a big tumor in the right lobe of the liver. This is our actual angio suite. Um, this is a multi-million dollar machine that, held, that basically allows us to do this. It allows us to see inside of the patient be able to put a catheter inside of the liver and deliver our directed therapy, which is either uh, chemoembolization or radioembolization, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, again, the differences in the type, bland embolization is just the embolics that block the blood flow to the liver. And if we add chemo to it, um, we also call it drug eluding beads, it's called chemoembolization. So this is embolics plus chemo. Our research has shown that there's an enhanced therapy when you introduce the chemo to the embolic material that goes into the liver. For patients with tumors in the liver, transarterial chemoembolization is a minimally invasive targeted treatment option. During the procedure, the doctor inserts a thin catheter into a vessel in the groin. Using x-ray imaging as a guide, the doctor moves the catheter to the specific vessel that supplies the tumor with blood. A mixture of chemotherapy and embolic particles, in the form of tiny beads, are injected through the catheter. This targeted treatment is delivered directly to the tumor. This prolongs the residence time of chemotherapy within the tumor, enhancing its effect. Shrinkage and necrosis, or tumor cell death, is seen on the follow-up MRI four to six weeks later. Because these chemotherapy particles are applied only to the tumor site, healthy tissue remains unaffected. The patient also has fewer side effects compared to regular chemotherapy. Okay, so next the thing that, that we commonly do is an ablation therapy. Ablation is completely different. What this basically involves is us going through using ultrasound or CAT scan, other imaging modalities. Um, we're able to put needles directly inside of the tumor and either burn them until we kill all the tumor or we cool, we cool them enough so that we also kill tumors. So you can, we can kill cells by either applying a large amount of heat to it or a large amount of um, cold or freezing the tumor. Um, so this is a, a common device that we use. This is actually a Covidian device that we use to treat um, tumors. And they tend to be, we use this therapy when the lesions are usually about three to four centimeters in size, not much bigger than that. Uh, and studies have shown that this is actually almost equivalent to um, as far as results for those size tumors are almost equivalent to surgical resection. And this is done through a very small skin incision, probably the size of a tip of a pen. Um, and uh, essentially, this kind of shows how, uh, you know, this patient had a liver tumor, and if you do like a cadaveric on a study, pa a study animal, you'll see that there's an ablation zone, which essentially kills the tumor. Cell death, we know, occurs at 50 to 60 degrees centigrade. Um, this is the opposite type of therapy where we actually put in a needle and we essentially form an ice ball and freeze the tumor. We freeze the tumor enough and that, again, it causes cell death. And cell death, we know from research, uh, is from negative 60 to negative 150 degrees. This is a real life patient uh, I was doing a microwave ablation on 
And uh, this is in our CAT scan machine. Patient has these probes where I'm essentially have them inside of a tumor. Um, this is my assistant and we're, we're getting ready to start an ablation in this procedure. This is a video that talks about heat radio therapy. It says radio frequency ablation, but it's almost equivalent to Among microwave. liver cancer patients, only 15 to 30% are candidates for surgery. For example, a patient who has several small tumors in different parts of the liver may not be a good candidate. Some patients cannot tolerate major surgery and may benefit from a less invasive approach. RFA, or radiofrequency ablation, can be used when surgical dissection is not a treatment option. RFA is a minimally invasive treatment for cancer. RFA is guided by digital imaging such as MRI, CT, or ultrasound, and heats and destroys cancer cells with a needle electrode. After examination and medication, the patient lies on the scanner. Grounding pads are placed on the patient's skin, enabling electrical current to pass out through the patient's body. The patient is slid into the scanner, and with imaging guidance, the physician locates the tumor. <coughs> Once the tumor is located, the needle electrode is guided through the skin and advanced to the site of the tumor. When the needle electrode is in place, tiny umbrella-like wires advance out through the needle to set the position and to widen the surface the electrode current affects. The electrode passes electrical current with a range of radio frequency waves creating heat around the tiny wires. The heat destroys the tumor, leaving normal healthy tissue unaffected. <laughs> During the procedure, the patient may experience a mild sense of heat or pain. Once the tumor is treated, the tiny wires are retracted into the needle. Next, the needle is removed. For multiple lesions, the same procedure is repeated at other sites. The dead tumor cells are gradually replaced by scar tissue that shrinks over time. RFA can be done as an outpatient procedure, making it a good option for patients who are not candidates for surgery. Um, the next short video is about uh, cryoablation, which is freeze, freezing therapy. In areas such as small renal masses. For this procedure, the patient is positioned face down in a CT scanner so that the exact location of the tumor can be determined. Once the location has been isolated, long needles called cryoprobes are placed into the tumor through the patient's skin. No cutting of the skin or muscle is required. Argon gas is circulated through the cryoprobes to create an extremely low temperature at the tips of the probes. Temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius kill the cancer cells. In order to ensure that the cells are killed, the area is thawed with circulating helium gas and frozen again. After the double freeze thaw cycle is complete, the cryoprobes are removed and the patient is on the way to recovery. Percutaneous cryoablation can also be used for thoracic and pulmonary tumors. When a tumor is small enough, only one cryoprobe is required. Circulating argon gas is still used to create the extremely cold temperatures to kill the cancer and helium gas is used to thaw the area. The CT scanner is used to ensure that the size of the ice ball is large enough to freeze the entire tumor plus a margin surrounding it. A double freeze thaw cycle is also used with the single cryoprobe procedure. After the cycle, the cryoprobe is removed and the procedure is complete. For some cases, such as liver metastases, the patient is positioned face up in the CT scanner. The area is viewed with the CT scanner, and cryoprobes are inserted from the side or front of the body to ensure that they reach the tumor. The freezing process is the same as for when a patient is laying face down in the CT scanner. Argon gas is circulated through the cryoprobes to freeze the area, and helium gas is circulated to thaw it. Temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius are achieved and a double freeze thaw cycle is used.
After the final thaw, the cryoprobes are removed and the patient begins recovery. Okay, so our, new, our newest technology that we have, so those are, I reviewed with you guys the transarterial chemoembolization and the ablation procedures. They're older technologies. One of the newest technology that we have, which is really becoming one of our best technologies and most powerful technologies, is Y90 radioembolization. Um, it's essentially, like I've discussed with the bland and the chemoembolization, these are small, tiny particles. However, they're not packed with drugs, they're packed with radiation. And is essentially, so the name of it, another name of it, instead of transarterial chemoembolization, is transarterial radioembolization or tear. It's basically high dose radiation particles implanted directly in the tumors. A lot of people ask, well, it's radiation therapy, it's probably going to go out of my body and affect my family members or infect my other organs. I think that was a question. The type of radiation, it's a beta radiation. It only travels a maximum distance of 11 millimeters. So it's really not going to go outside of the liver. It's really going to stay in the tumor. Um, and the reason I say it's one of our most powerful tools, it's because these are the cases that we were never able to offer any patients on. This is, this is a patient here with multiple tumors studded throughout the entire liver. This patient would have an extremely poor prognosis and probably be sent to hospice if they failed chemotherapy and they're, and they're not gonna be an operable candidate. Um, so it essentially provided an option for patients with advanced liver cancer. It's effective at both primary and metastatic liver tumors. Um, the difference, this slide kind of shows the difference between it and the other, uh, like a taste procedure or a bland embolization. The taste procedure, bland embolization, it's larger particles that block off the blood supply, or if it, this is uh, loaded with uh, chemo, it would elude the blood supply inside of the tumor. How about, however, with radio embolization, they're such small particles that they actually get embedded within the tumor. This uh, electron microscope here shows how small these particles are compared to like a fine human hair. Um, this is a slide, a pathology slide, that actually shows the tumor embedded within the tissue of cancer, essentially just staying in the cancer and working on the cancer, killing it. It's an outpatient procedure, and this is what I think is like almost mir miraculous about this procedure, is the fact that this, uh, we're able to treat these tumors and the patient comes in the morning and leaves on the same day. It's a two-phase procedure. They would first come in for us to map it. We want to make sure that if we give this radiation that it only stays in the liver and does not go outside of the liver, um, doesn't go into the lungs. So this, this would be phase one. We also map out the anatomy. In phase two, we give the administration and it stays in the liver and we take a photograph to confirm that all the radiation is in the liver and nowhere else. Um, this is a Surtex video which hopefully will kind of recap what I just told you. Selective internal radiation therapy, also known as CERT or radioembolization, is performed using surspheres microspheres. CERT is a targeted treatment for inoperable liver tumors that delivers millions of radioactive microspheres directly to liver tumors. The implantation of microspheres takes advantage of the fact that the normal liver parenchyma is primarily supplied by the portal vein while the hepatic artery is the primary blood supply for liver tumors. By using this preferential blood supply, tumors can be selectively irradiated, leaving healthy tissue relatively unaffected. CERT is a minimally invasive therapy in which a transfemoral microcatheter is used to gain access to the hepatic artery supplying the liver. After mapping the hepatic arterial system and isolating the hepatic vasculature to prevent the deposition of microspheres in the gastrointestinal tract, the microcatheter is advanced into the position from which the microspheres will be delivered. The microspheres are administered through this catheter. Administration should be conducted in a slow and deliberate manner to reduce the likelihood of early stasis and retrograde blood flow. The CERT procedure delivers beta radiation directly to liver tumors using the tumor's arterial blood supply. Microspheres are targeted directly at liver tumors via the hepatic artery, so exposure to the remaining healthy liver tissue is minimized. The microspheres average 32 microns in diameter, which is small enough to flow through the hepatic arteries, but are too large to pass through the capillary bed within the tumor where they become permanently implanted in the tumor. 
The microspheres contain the radioactive element yttrium-90, which delivers beta radiation over a relatively short distance, an average of 2.5 millimeters in human tissue. Yttrium-90 has a half-life of 64.1 hours. Therefore, 94% of the administered radiation dose is delivered in 11 days, with almost no activity remaining after a month. Clinical studies show that when used in combination with chemotherapy, surspheres microspheres can shrink patients' liver tumors more than chemotherapy alone, improve quality of life, and increase life expectancy. For a small number of patients, treatment can enable sufficient shrinkage of the liver tumors to permit future surgical resection. This is, uh, this is the therapy that Suzanne, Suzanne Lindley, who spoke earlier, t um, uh, had that kind of changed her life. Um, and we're very excited to offer it. Um, so why interventional oncology for liver tumors? Um, uh, as I think was, was, uh, was mentioned, unfortunately, we cannot surgically resect all patients. 70% um, of liver tumors are not surgical candidates at time of diagnosis, they're just too advanced. Um, a high percentage of liver cancer patients either become refractory uh, or not good candidates for, uh, for chemotherapy. Of course, we, a lot of times we would try that first. Un so unfortunately, many patients um, are not resectable or they, be, they, they reach in such an advanced stage in their chemotherapy that they're no longer uh, are responding to it. Um, this therapy um, has given hope to some of those patients um, who have kind of failed all other options. Uh, it's been shown to prolong survival. We sometimes can downstage tumors so that we can have a curative resection. And that's been, uh, that patients, many pa we've had many patients undergo that. Um, and also, as the video mentioned, it enhances the effects of chemotherapy if it's given with chemotherapy. Uh, these are the tumors that we treat, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, carcinoid, neuroendocrine tumor, cholangiocarcinoma, and primary liver cancer. Um, and uh, the advantages, uh, which we, I discussed, are minimally invasive. It's quick recovery time, can either outpatient procedure or one-day uh, hospitalization. It's safe in high-risk surgical candidates, and it's a repeatable procedure, which we use to our advantage. Um, so I'm, this is towards the end of my talk. Um, I'm going to just show you one patient um, that has been a success story for us. He's actually sitting here with us, and we very much appreciate that he's here. Uh, it's, his name is Lyndall Smith, um, and he's sitting in the back there. So please uh, feel free to speak to him about his experience with the procedure. Of course, you can also ask Suzanne, uh, who's had this therapy, about her experience. He came to us when he was 78 years old uh, in May of 2012, um, and he was diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma. He has multiple medical problems, lung problems, um, and again, we thank him for being here. You can see he's on oxygen um, uh, therapy right now. Um, also had heart problems, and uh, surgically he would not be able to tolerate a surgery. Um, he was also given Nexavar chemotherapy, but he wasn't able to tolerate it. That He developed um, reactions to it, which we had to take him off of it. Um, his MRI showed large liver masses, and he also had a kidney mass as well. His alpha fetoprotein, which is a tumor marker, which tells us, uh, it helps guide us as to how much tumor there is burden, was 13,700. Patients with uh, alpha fetal protein over 400, we are, we're highly concerned of alpha fetal protein, and his, his was 13,000. Um, this is the MRI that uh, he came in with. I'm just going to show you his largest lesion here. It was about 7.4 centimeter mass in the center of the liver, which makes it very difficult for any surgeon to try to resect because there's very vital structures in that area. Uh, this was May 4th, 2012. This is the kidney lesion, which happened to be an additional, a different type of tumor. Unfortunately, he had a hepatocellular carcinoma in the liver, plus he had a renal cell cancer um, that was not giving him problems at the time in the kidney. Um, because we know how deadly liver cancer is, we kind of tried to, uh, I don't want to say ignored, but we kind of put it on a back burner, the renal cancer, because we felt that the liver cancer would be the first to potentially take his life away. Um, so uh, we biopsied it with ultrasound, and then he went to our multidisciplinary tumor board. We decided that he's gonna go ahead and have this surspheres procedure. So this was, the surspheres procedure was, uh, the mapping was on May 18th, and his actual treatment day was on May 22nd, 2012. So let's remember that date, May 22nd, 2012. Um, 
on the left, this, is his, uh, this was his presentation. This was um, in May 4th, 2012. And on the right, you'll see these slides. Let's just focus on this top slide here for the next few slides. The 7.4 tumor in July, two months later, was now 6.5 centimeters. This is September 2012. The 7.4 centimeter tumor was now down to 3.6 centimeters. This is from one single treatment. Um, his 7.4 centimeter uh, mass is now 2.53 centimeters. This is uh, uh, March of 2013. Um, now, a year later, March 2014, it now measures, the 7.4 centimeter mass now measures 1.9 centimeters. He was just scanned last month on September 22nd, 2014, and his mass is very hard to find. It's 1.82 centimeters in size, whereas 7.4 centimeters. Now, I'll tell you that the, the uh, median survival for hepatocellular carcinoma in a lot of these patients is about six to seven months if they're not treated, if they were not able to get any tumor resection or chemotherapy, so, and he was not a candidate for any of these. Uh, he's been since 2012, two and a half years, and he's still live with us sitting at this, at this conference. So this is... Um, his alpha fetoprotein, if you remember, was 13,700. Um, uh, just last month, it's 176. So this is really good. Now, remember I mentioned that he had renal cell cancer, which we kind of, kind of ignored. Um, well, it kind of it asked us to treat it because in the interim, he bled. Um, he had a bleed around the, uh, the, uh, the renal mass and uh, we were uh, kind of forced to go ahead and treat it. And this is kind of a video that shows us doing a cryo-ablation of the lesion where we ended, ended, put it up three probes and froze the tumors so we can kill all the cancer cells. He was sent to a urologist to see if a, a urologist would be willing to resect the tumor. He was not a surgical candidate for that. So, and this, the, on the last uh, MRI that I have that shows the, the, the kidney, the tumor is much smaller in size and has not regrown. We've shrunk it significantly. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go through data, but I will tell you that uh, all the data that we have right now is shows that if you add surspheres in, combi in combination with chemotherapy, if you look at these, uh, these graphs, all of them, just gonna run through them, there's an improved survival by adding surspheres as opposed to either not doing anything at all or just using chemotherapy alone for patients that are non-resectable. Yes, ma'am. Um, Yes, it is. Okay, so in, I would say, and uh, please Ron or Donna, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but actually it's not just Texas. I think we have the most amount of experience with Y90 radiotherapy in the entire Southwest. Um, we've been on, we've done, this center has done this uh, procedure when it was first available for patients. Um, this was early in two, 2002 is when we started to do it. And uh, we've we just developed a lot of experience with it. I'll tell you that we probably, if I had to, last time we checked, which is a few months ago, we've done close to 1,000 Y90 radio embolization cases. Um, I personally have done over 100 of them. Um, and uh, we've had very good success. Do you have this long waiting list of people wanting to do this? Well, thankfully, we're five interventional radiologists. We're multiple surgeons. We have, uh, you know, multiple hepatologists. We have the Liver Institute. We do not wait on these cancers because we know that the time is extremely valuable um, and that patients can't, won't wait for us. So we get them in as quickly as possible. I would say from time to consultation to treatment, we've uh, streamlined it that it's about, I want to say, two weeks. So this seems like it's kind of a last effort for a lot of people. Why is it? So um, the reason it has been a last effort is because of data. Um, however, that, there, that's going to that's gonna change very soon. Um, in the beginning of uh, the first quarter of next year, we're expected to have the results from our first large 500 patient study that basically looks at using it earlier in the treatment algorithm with combination with first line chemotherapy, for example, for colorectal cancer. Um, I think the interventional radiology community thinks that that's going to be a, a game changer. 
Um, I think right now, it's all the study that we have are lower number patients, less than 100 patients. For interventional radiology, less than 100 patients is a lot because there's not a lot of interventional radiologists out there. We're not as many as, as uh, a lot of the other disciplines. Uh, but however, for the rest of the medical community to recognize us, they want to see large numbers. They want to see patients over 500 or 1,000 patients that are looked in the study. And it is our expectation that there's going to be a significant uh, um, survival benefit to introducing this earlier in the therapy. Thank you.